Okay, so you guys don't really need my help to get started. I'll just, a couple of uh, opening comments. One is, I would like to know what he means by pure consciousness. He keeps, you know, that, that phrase shows up early and it keeps popping up and he never explains what he means by pure consciousness. And I'm wondering if that's what, if it's anything like what he was talking about at the beginning of the book before self-consciousness consciousness popped up. But he, you know, like the first time I see it in today's reading is on page 282 in the middle of section 484. Uh, he says, confronting this latter consciousness is the former unity of the self with the es with essence or actual consciousness confronting pure consciousness. And then he just goes on and talks about pure consciousness every now and then all through this whole section. So I don't really know what that means and how is it related to self-consciousness because he, he contrasts pure consciousness to other consciousness words here and there. Um, other than that, and you know, just lots of other questions about stuff. I thought what was, well, you know, that's why I told Chase, hey, Chase, read these two sections. I thought that toward the end, the section on language was really fascinating. Um, he said, you know, I some interesting things there. And then the section that was 507 and section 508, I thought was pretty, you know, I'm always trying to figure out what the hell is this dialectic thing anyway. And in, in a section 508, where he starts talking about spirit as the mediation and it, that like it's the mediation becomes the, I don't know what the right word is. I don't want to say real or actual because those are words that mean special things. But it's like the rather than the moment, you know, before it seems like you've got this moment and then it's opposite moment pops up and sublates the first moment and then that just keeps happening. But here you get the mediation itself is what becomes primary. And that seems to be what what he identifies with spirit. So I thought, at least for me, I'm, I'm always looking for these little clues to try to figure out what the hell is dialectic and being and all this stuff. I thought that was there was maybe a clue there when he was focusing on the role of mediation. Um, but anyway, those were kind of the, and then the, you know, the whole, I, I was kind of wondering what Eric, Eric, the, uh, the uh, Frankfurt Marxian thought about the, uh, the monarch here at the end. I was going to type into the chat. I forgot to do it that, I am the monarch and therefore I am the universal power and therefore you owe me tribute and I will accept payment on, on a Venmo and PayPal. But I was kind of curious as to what Eric thought about the, the uh, you know, the, the, sh this monarch showing up or, or, you know, an Ed too, you know, what, it, what uh, the sort of, and, and I, and he, you know, I was actually, I was talking to Joseph about this, on a Discord earlier, it's hard. It's hard for me to sometimes to figure out. You know, we had this problem, especially with Merleau-Ponty, but trying to figure out when is Hegel describing something as part of a dialectical process, and when is he actually endorsing something as this is something I think is good. It's hard to tell sometimes, and you know. So I want to say, well, he's saying, you know, that this is really the great thing, you know, this monarch thing. But I'm always wondering, like, I'm not sure because. You know, two pages later, he may say, nope, this is sublated, and then goes on to something else. So, you know, there's always that possibility, nope, sublated. So anyway, I'll stop talking. Yeah, I was curious about the monarch because I was wondering if it goes hand in hand with what Ed was saying, that you can't be anti-monarchy at that time and, and, <laughs> uh, and, and not risk serious um, physical repercussions. Um, it, Please forgive me for being late. Sorry about that. Because um, for what what I got from this reading, I I have a lot to talk about. Um, was it mainly in this sense that he he felt that the spirit of culture was almost a shadow, or a self alienating outside of itself uh, bad thing as compared to the spirit of ethics, where you know the Greek community dwelled, and that this spirit of culture was almost perpetuating this uh, 
destruction of the spirit of uh, of the being for self to perpetuate itself as a universal at least that's the way i interpreted it when i started this, this particular reading and i thought it was fascinating because i think at least from my perspective we're starting to see where his epistemology is playing a role in his crit criticism of culture particularly how he associated the state um being like for in itself and being the universality which is good and and wealth being individuality and for itself which is bad so i had to go back and review the way that consciousness worked with perception because it's almost like towards the end he was using the same terminology for language that he did for force like this self-perpetuating culture was almost like a consciousness that wasn't part of its proper understanding of spirit destroying the natural self and then using language to substitute force but i don't know if that's the right interpretation Um, actually, Eric, did you want to say something? Oh, I was going to weigh in on the on the question of the monarch. Um, and you know, with regard to um, uh, Nevitt's last comment about you know, it's hard to know at what point he's uh, he's just kind of laying something out as as a moment within an ultimate process, or whether he's actually fully endorsing something as like a finished product. Um, I think up to this point, pretty much everything has been a moment in an unfolding process, but at the same time. I expect that when we get to the end, when we, we uh, read absolute knowing that we'll, we'll be told that every one of these moments is of equal importance in the process. And so I don't think that he ever fully pulls it away and says not, right? I think, you know, he might, you know, so the, the, the part about the monarch that we read, I was thinking probably we're thinking, he's, he's addressing Louis the 14th more than, um, I, I, I don't know, I might be getting my history wrong, but Frederick, the, uh, the enlightened emperor, you know, who was, who was more of a um, cultured figure um, that, that, you know, Germans operating had to respect, you know, in, in enlightenment times, but uh, Louis XIV was more like the absolute monarch, right, as opposed to the enlightened monarch. And I suspect divine, you know, the, the philosophy of right and, and uh, the parts where Hegel's philosophy does kind of like throw something out to the powers that be is, is more deferential to a Frederick type monarch than a Louis XIV. So just in the context of this section we're reading, I took that to be let Louis XIV. Um, basically, this is a moment in unfolding. We're about to burst into revolution, uh, French revolution, I feel, right? Um, but that, I, you know, in, in, in the final sense where everything is, you know, brought together in a, in a sense of the whole, in the whole process, I don't think he ever fully pulls away, you know, the importance of, in, in a dialectic history, the importance of having a moment like a Louis XIV moment, right? Which leads me to question, right? Like, it, it almost begs for the necessity of authoritarian structures somewhere along the way. You know what I mean? Um, you can justify all, you can justify anything if you can say it's part of a process, you know, that ultimately rebounds on itself. Right. And so um, even if he does not ultimately endorse the final state of the monarch that we've read, he seems to endorse it as a moment, which still to me is questionable. Um, and, you know, we, you know, there's more there's more more to discuss, but just on the, on the question of the monarch there, I wanted to, to try to feel that for a little bit. Well, I was just thinking, Eric, when you were talking and, and based on, on what the other said today already. If Louis the Fourteenth existed, he ruled in a certain type of way. He represented or embodied a certain type of state. If you, if we accept that that is true, then it was something that was possible. It was something that existed. It had something that acted, and at the same time was acted upon. I mean, my my sense is. I really think I think I think Hegel's trying to get at what is historical knowledge or what is the what do we mean when we talk about the flow of history? 
I, it, it's almost to me sometimes this is a, a philosophy of history not a philosophy of consciousness and sometimes the sense of it being a philosophy of history goes far far away you know like a consciousness in itself and for itself whenever it sounds like epistemology or something but especially when he's talking about monarchy and 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 all these other things he he i, I think he's trying to get a sense of <clears throat> Once something is introduced into human history, how is that going to play out? You know, is there any patterns? Is there any concepts that we can develop to understand this unfolding? I mean, in 1900, could anybody predicted Nazism, right? As actually a broad political movement. But now, sadly, we can't forget that Nazism existed and it still exists. Look at the United States. I mean, it's it's appalling. Speaking personally, but but once once Nazism emerged as as some kind of ideology and mass movement, we can't pretend it it's not going to have an effect on different futures. I think I think you raise an important point. Um, it does sometimes feel like you know there's a philosophy of history. And I know he writes more explicitly about philosophy of history, but part of my objection is that he doesn't present it as a philosophy of history. He doesn't present Louis XIV as a contingent episode that the, the ultimate human realization of human freedom could have done with or without, right? Um, my sense is that he presents this as a necessary episode in the eventual unfolding of human freedom. And insofar as it's, it's presented as a necessary episode, then you, you know, then you can just turn turn around and justify all sorts of brutality, saying, well, in the long arc of things, the backlash against me will be the most sublime. You know? Oh, sure, but Eric, think of it this way. Think of how you use the concept necessity or that it was necessary. I think the way I, I, I beg your pardon for saying I think I I'm getting an understanding of Hegel, but when Hegel's using the word necessary, I don't think that's necessarily um, a word that he uses to legitimize that government. What I mean is I remember a conversation about the Soviet Union when the Soviet Union was still in existence and there was a liberal Sovietologist by the name of, I think his name was Robert Tucker. And he was saying Stalin was an, uh, uh, Stalin was a uh, aberration. That Stalin was not uh, something that inherently had to come out of Leninism, Marxist Leninism. Well, the Soviet leadership took great umbrage at that and said, no, 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 silly man. Stalin was not an aberration. You know, Stalin was a part of Marxist Leninism. And 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 like now they, they certainly went further than just saying he was historically necessary and then defended some of his actions. But but if something has actually happened from all of these causes and effects, doesn't it seem like it was the contingency went in certain directions and then reinforced each other? I, you know, what I, that's one thing I can't, and, and another thing just confuses me is that in this whole book, uh, Hegel talks about contingency and necessity back and forth. And I don't really, so he accepts that, that he accepts both. So it's not like a hard, I don't get the impression he's a hard determinist. It's, but it's, you know, it's like, I don't know what, it's like the broad, maybe the broad outlines of the dialectic are necessary, but the, but the you know, the way that they manifest in particular events is contingent or something. I. I don't really. So that's one thing I'm, I, you know, I'm, I'm struggling with is what is exactly what does he mean by necessity and by contingency? Think of the role of Napoleon. Think of Napoleon Bonaparte. He actually created mass armies, in some ways created the modern liberal state and authoritarian form, but he was still operating within a European historical religious tradition. So who crowned his wife empress? The Pope. And then Napoleon, the rude shit, took the, the crown from the Pope and put it on his own head to crown himself. I mean, that, that to me is an amazing moment in world history. 
him taking the crown from the Pope, a Corsican, and putting it on his own head. But what I'm saying there is, yes, he did extraordinarily interesting, innovative things, but already we can still identify them within a certain historical European Christian context. So you have the innovation, and yet you have the framework operating at the same times. Does that make sense? Yeah, um, I was going to say, uh, in terms of the, the question about contingency and necessity and how they show up in history, um, I think a lot of people cite the, the, the passage about the owl of, owl of Minerva flies at dusk, right? Um, and that is to say that, you know, well, I, in the context or in, you know, married with other, he, you know, Hegelian preachings, um, that from the perspective of the present looking forward, everything is contingent. But from the perspective of the past, looking backwards, everything unfolds. It's in its or is shown to be in its necessity, um, which really doesn't help us a whole lot in terms of like theorizing the present and the future. But that's another question. So Hunter, just FYI, we've been yeah probably figured out we've been talking about the monarchy stuff at the end i okay so a couple things first off my video is really weird uh, do i sound normal do i sound normal right okay but my video is like super zoomed in and like to the right i don't know what's going on with it but i'm just gonna leave it i don't know why it's like that but um i also i was literally in vr with the headset on since like 1 p.m today I have been, oh, I look fine. It's not the drugs. I'm not on any drugs, Nevit. Uh, you my, say it like it's a bad thing. Yeah, you know, you're right. I should be more accepting. Um, it was uh, it's just Oculus Quest 2, just to respond, Joseph. I was just doing, like a professor's doing a VR thing and they wanted some help looking at some meetup software on VR. Anyway, I was just doing that and now I'm here. Now I'm thrust into this. Uh, so we're talking about monarchy, huh? Okay, what about it? Who cares? What's what? Yeah, monarchy sucks. Who cares? It's monarchies. Well, know. we were at the beginning. We were trying. We were uh, talking about what to what degree uh, Hegel is endorsing this monarchy, yeah. and also to. And I don't know if this actually came up or not. But sort of, you know, to what degree is a monarch? The monarchy sort of uh, maybe necessary is too strong a word, but but uh, he, a natural outcome of, of the dialectic. Well, I mean, on one hand, I, I think if you want to talk about it as a natural outcome of the dialectic, I think this is, th we're still, we're not done yet, you know? He's like, we're, like, we quit, we quit the reading right at the place where he's talking about, like, the experience of pure consciousness or the experience of, the experience of consciousness in its, or self-consciousness, I suppose, in its actuality and it's unfolding through the op the opposition between actual consciousness as actual consciousness and pure consciousness as this thing that recognizes things as good and bad so he's saying you know you you get into this mode or, or spirit spirit and self-conscious spirithood gets into this mode of relating to itself as seeing the world in the form of good and i'm trying to gesticulate but it's not really happening because i'm cut off whatever between like good and bad on one hand versus uh, state power and wealth, this amoral game of power on one hand versus this totally moral game of abstraction, good and good and evil, you know, the fight of truth and justice versus darkness and evil versus, you know, this other opposition, which is just state power and wealth. You know what I mean? Like these material pragmatic sort of elements of, of what constitute the expression or the actualization of, of thought and purpose, content, content form and purpose. But my point is that we get to this point where, where state power, the only reason that he's talking about monarchy right now is that state power and noble consciousness get to this point within the dialectic, yes, but they get to this point where they start subverting each other and only have this unity in the mediating movement of language and noble consciousness sees itself as the source of language, right? And is like, okay, well, 
if all this stuff only has unity in language, and I, as the extreme of the self, considering I am a noble consciousness, I, I'm the source of language. Uh, and, and if language is the mediating moment here, it's trying to stand in, it's trying to stand self-sufficiently, uh, you know, in the same space as this, as this, um, this thing which I am trying to support, like the state power, you know, this notion of, of state power as being equal to my consciousness or whatever, right? I, in order to, you know, in order to not bring up some new pillar of opposition against, or maybe not even opposition, but another player in the game, maybe I should just sh like pipe down. I should just shut up because I, you know, language is the mediating movement wherein this power that I owe myself to or that I've committed myself to starts to move and twist and shake and start to dissolve. I don't want to do that. So I'm just going to shut up and stop talking. And hopefully this gig will kind of ride itself out. You know, I, I, I as the source of language, enter into what he calls uh, silent servitude. It enters into this, ve this, this attempt at silent servitude which, and then he says, ultimately, the problem is this, you know, this spirit of ethics at dedicating itself to the silent servitude to its ethical code, it just becomes flattery. It becomes like this, like, you know, this be, being a yes man, just be like, yeah, you know, whatever. Uh, because silence in itself is a form of speech. You know what I mean? If, if the king says to you, if you're his trusted court advisor, and he says, oh, do you think we should sack Carthage? And you just st sit there and kind of stare at the floor. He's going to be like, okay, that's great. I guess you seem to feel weird. You, it seems like you feel weird about this. What's that about? Talk to me, you know? And if you don't, he'll imprison you. Or if you, you know, what, you know, see what I'm saying? Uh, but to, to, to speak in silent servitude would actually be to just be a yes man, it would be flattery. So he's saying it enters into this state of flattery to the human law and this, this silent servitude reflects universal authority back into itself, makes that authority from in itself into being for itself, and it becomes the unlimited monarch. And he's saying like, he's not saying like, yes, finally, we have the glorious unlimited monarch that we've been trying to construct. He's like, no, this is like just a byproduct of this really weird set of of, of movements that happen from the perspective of a self-conscious unfolding. Uh, and he says, so this unlimited monarch is, is this embodiment of contradiction, this, this embodiment of the consciousness of all the people that he's above, while also being cut off from all the people that he's above. And he has this name, this name like the king, or King Louis XIV, or the Caesar, you know what I mean? And that name is the embodiment, or is the, is the, is the interpolation of his embodiment. It's, it's this reflective turn which, which it's, it's what Lacan calls the quilting point. It's hard to make sense of, but the point is he enters into this place as the unlimited monarch with this name, this title of being the unlimited monarch to where he, he is, it's like, it's like through the name unlimited monarch or whatever name we give the unlimited monarch, like, like you know, the suzerain or, or the Caesar or whatever, through that name, universal power becomes a, it merges with actuality. This universal concept merges with material reality and vice versa. A singular individual becomes known and regarded as the universal power. And that's where we cut off our reading. By, and, and isn't that, it's kind of a cliffhanger, but like, like I, my basic point is that he's just saying that it's a part of this unfolding series of logical conclusions you know what i mean that can be drawn from these preceding logical steps you know what i mean and so it's not necessarily that he's he's exalt he's saying that like yes i'm so i'm so glad that we're finally at the unlimited monarch you know but at the same time to not to not downplay the suspicion because you are i would say that i don't know from my reading i think it's right to say that Hegel sees the monarchy, or not just monarchy, but he sees, he sees a monarch. He sees a monarch as an irrational thing. 
He sees the 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 sustaining, the the supporting, the adherence to a monarch as this inherently sort of irrational turn for a state, because you have a totally rational state apparatus that operates on a series of of laws that are formed out of the firmament of the ethical substance of the people in that state. This totally rational law that is totally this, just this, this, this theoretical, this is all hypothetical theoretical in the realm of pure, like in a, in a vacuum. It's like solving physics problems in high school. It's like in a vacuum, theoretically, the law would be the embodiment of everybody's ethical substance, um, or, or at least would be the simple self of the ethical essence. Um, and, and when you have a monarch, you have somebody who's supposed to be the total speaker for everybody's wills all at once, but is at, at de facto cut off from everybody. He's totally cut off. He's totally estranged. He's this freak who lives in this golden or ivory tower, who doesn't realize what it's like to be a normal person anymore, or who just doesn't care what I'm thinking or has no, has no connection to me through the gap of absolute otherness, both in his, in his name, in his position within the, the, the social strata, and, and just, just physically, functionally, literally, like logically, he's separated from me. And so for him to do that, it's just this, it's this contradictory little point. This, it's, like, it's like you had the rational state as like a series of kind of lines of reasoning that are trying to kind of resolve themselves, like everybody thinks Hegel says they do, like into this, into this final sort of ultimate beautiful like point of success you know, and, and, and speculative unity to unite everything in the true universal of absolute knowing or whatever. And he's saying like, no, what happens is you have all these lines of reasoning that don't go anywhere and that seem to twist all around. And then at a certain point up at the top, you just kind of take them, twist them around themselves and cinch it off. And that is called the master signifier. And another term for that would be the monarch. And, and what that implies though, is that that would have to be existent at the other end too. And I think that is the case, is that Hegel says that the, the, the state as the rational totality to be a totally rational state, which would be the ideal of what a state could be, you would need an irrational point in the form of the rabble at the bottom and the monarch at the top. And, he, and I, at least from what I've read on his, on his, his lectures on aesthetics and things like that, uh, his position on, on monarchy or whatever seems to be that, yes, you need a monarch, but, but only because of the functional necessity for an irrational point of, of support for a totally rational system. You need an irrational point of support for a totally rational system uh, and so you need a monarch, and this is and and what Maladin Dolar has said about this 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 notion of monarchy is that it, it, the best bet for a monarch would be to have it something like the king, like the Queen of England, where it's like just some idiot. He's just so, like like the perfect monarch is like a just a just a dummy who who will sign papers and show up to meet it like big events and cut ribbons and you know wave at parades and stuff. And then go sit on their throne and not get in the way, because they're they're an idiot, <laughs> you know. And, but they, you still need some idiot who's at least there as a functional element of the of the structure of the of the even as a minimally sort of consistent symbolic structure. He has to kind of sit there. You, you know what I mean? Uh, so in a way, I think yes, he is saying that a king is like a necessary part of a society, but in a very weird way, in a very, very, very weird way. Um, but yeah, I don't know. Um, but yeah, that's it. May, may, I'm not sure that this is a real important point, but <clears throat> one of the things I asked at the beginning and you mentioned it, so maybe you could help me a little bit. What does he, what does he mean by pure consciousness, because he throws that term in a whole lot in this section, and he contrasts pure consciousness with self-consciousness and with other consciousness words. So, I don't know, so Hunter, you mentioned that. What do you think, he, what does he mean? And I, I was wondering, does this have any relation to 
I'm guessing probably not, but does this have any relation to consciousness at the beginning of the book prior to the appearance of self-consciousness or is it something that just he throws in here for I don't know why? Well, actually that, that second question, you that's kind of open-ended for me. Cause is, it, is this pure consciousness? I would have to think about, is this pure consciousness related to the consciousness at the beginning of the book? Because he's talked about how, like there was a point in the book, I don't know if you guys remember, but he was like, spirit like he kind of revealed it a little bit earlier he was like we're all spirits okay listen like i know i've been kind of jerking you around for however many pages but we're spirits okay and if you and, it, and if a spirit tries to analyze itself it sees itself as having been all these other shapes you know and it thinks that that's what it was at some point and that's him saying like i kind of did that i would that was kind of what i was doing i was kind of just but it was him showing like, it wasn't necessarily that spirit was those things at some point in time, but that it's, it's a part of the logical analysis of the makeup of the spirit, which we've, we've agreed. It's, it's not necessarily a temporal thing, but so I don't know if that consciousness, if I had to connect it to, or if I'm sure I can, because it's Hegel and you can do anything, <laughs> not really, um, you know, can't, but but my point is what I do know. Here's what I'm gonna just to, just to get to actual like, seri you know, somewhat somewhat serious theoretical work. Also, Chase, I'll look for that. Um, some some serious theory. There's a point at page two eighty seven, I think. Let me see. Let me see. Two eighty six. No wait. Two eighty seven. No, two eighty nine. Yes, 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 yes. It's 289. Sections 494 and 495 on page 289. Uh, he talks about pure consciousness. And here's my basic reading and what it means to me is he says spirit is in a place of divided poles, these divided poles, these poles of, of and, and, and the two the two poles that are that it's split between, by the way, are like wealth and state power, good and bad. You know what I mean? Um, and and actually, he starts pretty simple at the beginning of this section. He says the split of between the pole that's splitting is self consciousness and externality. It's like just the it and the thing that's not it as a as a very basic formal gesture. So he's like, that's kind of the first iteration of these opposed poles but then the whole theme of the chapter up to this point was him talking about consciousness or self-consciousness interacting with this negative nature of itself and this external actual this external actuality that it's confronting and how it when confronting that external actuality as a negative nature experiences alienation then is alienated from its alienation you know goes through all these all these pitfalls and, and maneuvers around problems and engenderings of actuality by renouncing itself and, you know, these sort of weird moves that spirit or self-consciousness is making. And, and at this point, and so the, the point, I think the theme or the pattern that I'm recognizing is that it keeps splitting things into poles. It keeps taking a, a, it, it, there's, in fact, there's even a point where earlier where he says spirit posits a double world in the form of two opposed poles. Like, it, it's kind of like the opposite of, you know, Mao Zedong, he had a quote where Mao Zedong talked about um, uh, one divides into two and two unite into one. You know what I mean? Um, and, and I've heard, this is a neo-Hegelian point, but neo-Hegelians have said it's the opposite for Hegel. It's, it's that one unites into two and two divide into one in this way that just sounds like, like nonsense. But the, the, the reasoning is that there's, there's a fundamental deadlock or contradiction that we reach. We're trying to solve a problem. We reach a deadlock, we reach an impasse, some sort of contradiction that we can't get past. And then this single irresolvable contradiction is then simplified by saying, wait, wait, wait. It's not this constant moving, dynamic, confusing, living mess. It's actually just two substantial poles 
that are standing against each other in tension, like masculinity and femininity, you know, or, or, or essence and appearance, you know, or truth and falsehood. He says that, or the, the, these, like, like I'm saying, I guess the point is, you know, one unites into two in the form, in the, in the sense that this amorphous, vague, and, and open-ended one is then simplified into two rock solid points that are easier to conceptualize, easier to understand, easier to swallow, way more sensible if it's just, oh, it's just the two of them fighting rather than this irresolvable problem at the heart of my experience that makes me question like everything if I take it too far. No, 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 no. It's actually just these two substantial entities in, in the tension of the universe. You know what I mean? Like, like that, you know, this sort of, and this is a very vulgar, but like, like a vulgar Western misreading of the notion of yin and yang as these, as these two sort of powerful entities that keep each other in check and flow into each other, whatever. You know what I mean? He would say that's not what's going on. Um, yeah, this, this unity, this superficial unity of polar opposites in thought. Uh, so back to this. Uh, so spirit is engaging in this mode of dividing and polarizing and so solidifying, you know, petrifying, uh, opposing, splitting apart, you know, he, it's constantly, spirit just keeps getting confronted with irresolvable contradictions and then splitting it up and saying, maybe, maybe I can make sense of it if I just split it up again, if I make it some substantial argument between two bodies rather than some irresolvable question. And so spirit in these divided poles takes cognizance in the, he's talking about in the, in the process of doing this, it takes cognizance of its substance, content, and purpose. It says substance, content, and purpose. He kind of says that as open as an open-ended thing to, for me to scratch my head at and feel stupid for a little bit. But later on, he reveals that it's through language. It's, it's through language that it, it takes cognizance of its substance, content, and purpose. So spirit finds these, uh, these poles and, these, and concepts like wealth and, and, and state power to be like objects which it's free from. You know, all these poles and all this, all this substance and content and purpose and all this, all this wealth and state power. I can see these as objects, objects for my consciousness. This, this would be like the Sartrean move. This is him kind of, kind of uh, prophesying the, the rise of Sartre, excuse me. <laughs> uh, and so it's, it sees it like objects, which it can be free from ultimately. There's these contingent objects. These concepts are just contingent objects that it doesn't need. And that's where it enters into this, this sense of almost self-assurance, this state of like, I don't need any of this. I'm a pure consciousness. I can be a pure consciousness if I want to. I really am free. And it feels it, it engages in it. It, it focuses not on state power and wealth, right? but shifts over to the, to the focus on good and bad. And this is where we start with that. This is where we get that opposition is the good and bad. The notion of splitting things up into good and bad for him is just a movement of pure consciousness of, of seeing things not as attached to actuality. It's sort of like, gosh, it's sort of like, like, uh, state power and wealth are on the side of like Dasein and like this embodied in, like in the world experience in a way, at least to, to, in, a, in, in a very limited sense, but in a sense. But if I bring myself into the state of pure consciousness where I'm not so concerned with living in the world or my life world or my Dasein, it's just good and bad. And good is equality of self-consciousness with reality. And bad is inequality of my self-consciousness with my experience of reality, you know? And, and this move of pure consciousness is the, is the conceptualizing, the peeling away from real or actual determinations that then nonetheless required the support of these non-actual or non-real determinations, like the thing which we are equal or unequal to, uh, which is why he says self-consciousness here in this move 
makes them what they are. You know, it's one minute, it's throwing away reality. The next minute, it's yanking reality back in and saying, you need to check your facts, buddy, because I say it's one way and you say it's another way. And that means either you're evil or I'm evil. You know, one of us is, is, is messed up here. You know, self-consciousness is trying to like rest control. And, and in a way, it makes these things that it's talking about, these concepts and these objects, it makes them what they are. And they, and thus, this is the conclusion of this section on pages 288 and 289, like I talked about, the conclusion of these, this thought, in my opinion, is that they are these thoughts, these, these good and bad and state power and wealth and yada, 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 they are in themselves what they are relative to spirit. And this is getting into what, what I meant when I said that the in itself for Hegel is seen as pure phenomena. You know what I mean? It's, uh, yeah, I guess it's fair. The, the things are, they literally really are in themselves what they are totally relative to spirit because spirit is, is taking up the, the positioning and the, the giving and the taking, you know, the manipulating, the, maybe not even the manipulating, but the dividing, the, the substantializing and the desubstantializing. Consciousness is in charge of what goes where and who does what and, and when they do it and makes these things what they are in the same sense that Nevit, we talked about how my thoughts, my ideas are, they are in the world. When I think something, it is. My thought really is a part of actuality. And in that sense, I am thinking actuality all the time. You know what I mean? And so if these concepts if these concepts are like, like if you ask like a donkey or something, like, what do you think about pure consciousness or my, your, what's your content or what's your substance or your, your purpose? He would be, I don't know. <laughs> you know, just make a noise. You just make a noise. But, but if these concepts are to have any sort of coherence or cogency or, or, or you know, efficacy, it's in their relation to spirit. They only have meaning or substantial reality or efficacy relative to spirit. They are in themselves only what they are relative to spirit. You know what I mean? And, and he's arguing that we take that rule and apply it, to, or and not apply it, but it, 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 it undergirds our relationship to concepts and all of our relations to all things are Inter interwoven with concepts and, con and the act of conceptualizing, if we can even call it an act, you know what I mean? And so in a way they are in themselves what they are relative to spirit. But, but this sort of idealist talk, you know, of they are only what they are in themselves relative to spirit, you know what I mean? It's coming about as a part of his discussion of this move of consciousness trying to free itself and become pure consciousness or embody or engender pure consciousness, which doesn't care about wealth and state power. Wealth and state power are just contingent operations of those automatons out, out there. You know, what I know is good and bad. And what I know is equality and inequality with myself. You know what I mean? Trying to really reduce itself and be pure, like like a Cartesian cogito in a way. But this is a, that's a, this is a sort of a reductionist way to think about it a little bit, probably. But or in some ways, I know for sure. But that's my reading of what he is saying when he's trying to introduce this notion of pure consciousness. And I think that the rest of the section, or at least a good portion of it, is in the aftermath of that move of try of consciousness trying to trying to embody or engender pure consciousness. That's it. So I, I wanted to look at, in relation to that section of 508 on page 295. So I, I mean, I don't, I, I'm not gonna at all dispute your interpretation of that, you know, 491 and so on, but it, this 508 seems to be in tension with that. And that, that's why I like to bring it up. So in 508 on page 295, he says, um, so spirit contains this actuality here because these extremes and so on and so on, this unity emerges. Well, let me just, I'll go ahead and read it. Spirit contains this actuality here because the extremes whose unity it is 
it is just as immediately each have the determination to be for its own actuality. Their unity is subverted into aloof aspects, each of which is for the other an actual object excluded from it. The unity thus emerges as a mediating middle, which is excluded and distinguished from the departed actuality of these two aspects, thus in itself has an, uh, has an actual objectivity differentiated from its aspects, and it is for them, that is, it, that is, it is existent. The spiritual substance enters into existence. First, while it has gained for aspects the sort of self-consciousness which knows this pure self to be an actuality which is immediately in force, and therein it just as immediately knows that this it is this actuality only through the alienating mediation. Anyway, and I could keep reading for a little bit more, but my, my question here then is, you know, what you were saying before, if I understood what you're saying, it's that it's like spirit induces or not induces, but spirit kind of separates these, these poles and concretizes them in a way. But here, it seems to be the opposite movement. It sounds like here you have these poles and then spirit emerges as the unifying mediating middle, which that's why, I mean, what this 508 reminded me of was Kierkegaard who said, you know, who, who, who said the spirit is this, this activity that unifies the finite and the infinite. And, you know, that's, that you don't have a self unless there is this unification of these poles within the, you know, the, the consciousness. But so, may, you know, maybe Kierkegaard is riffing on this, but, but anyway, that, that's the difference there I was, I was wondering about is here it sounds like this spiritual substance emerges from the relation of these opposites rather than the spirit generating or concretizing the opposites. It sounds like the, the generation kind of is in the opposite direction. And that then this is the, the pure self, which that at least seems to be consistent with what you were saying, which I, I mean, thank you for that. I, I had completely missed this idea that the, if I understand you right, the pure self is kind of the, the self isolating from actuality in a way and just kind of, you know, um, I'm pure consciousness and to hell with all that nasty actuality shit. But, but how do you, but I mean, how, how is that related to what you were saying in the, a little bit further on that same section in this way, spirit is the mediating middle, which presupposes those extremes and is engendered through their existence. So again, it sounds there like spirit, this is in that was in 508 again on 295. It sounds like spirit is in, a, is in some sense generated by the opposites rather than generating them or concretizing. First off, just Eric, did you have anything to say? Um, no, you go first. Oh, uh-oh. <laughs> well, that gives me no time. That's fine. Okay, what, let's do it. Okay. Uh so the basic, okay, so the basic question as far as I get it is, does self-consciousness concretize terms or does the concreteness of terms actualize consciousness? You know, does, does actual consciousness concretize terms or does the concreteness of terms actualize consciousness? I guess, which, which one produces which? Is a chicken and the egg, you know what I mean? Um, and, and I guess my, my, my basic takeaway from 508 is that he enters into that discussion after 507, which is about, like I said, this, um, this, this intervention of language. Now, now this, uh, um, okay. He says through 507, the basic gist of 507 is that language alone can express the I, not in an actuality which it can escape from or retreat from or retract itself from or, you know, whatever kind of pull back from, but, but language can express, can actually express the I because the I is a contradictory thing 
And language operates in a contradictory way that can capture the contradiction of the I within itself. It's kind of like, this is what I was talking about, Nevit. It's like, how do you think actuality? It's like the limitation of language, the, co this, like, the contradictory nature, nature of language is what makes it possible for language to capture or actually express the contradictory nature of the I. Like he's saying, like there's this contradictory term that is, you know, able to be expressed because language is faulty and contradictory, and and has this this sort of uh, what some would call this a fundamental defect in the in the fabric of language. People would call this like a fundamental defect, this this problem of justification or whatever, right? Um, the contradict, like like uh, the failure of the predicate, for example, is one part of it. Like like the notion that the subject is is always always like the very basic the very most basic gesture of self-identity of a term produces difference and so any sort of sense of consistency in self-identity or in the identity of a single thing with itself totally falls apart because it's like you said you know the boy is a boy you know and and even and you said it before like, oh, when I say the boy is a boy, that means that the boy is behaving in a way expectable of other boys. And my point is like, that is similar or operating in the same way as when I say man is still a man or, or boys will be boys, you know, or whatever. It's, it's, there is a, there is a difference between the first term and the second, even in the just basic repetition of a term with no other further determinations, just the, the boy is the boy. You know what I mean? The boy is the boy. It doesn't even have to be the boy is a boy because the boy is a boy is a real clear, like that's an obvious split, you know, between an individual and a category, but the boy is the boy, you know? In my in the act of my writing or enunciating or expressing this this self identity, the rose is the rose, right? The 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 subject, the subject rose or boy or whatever, is followed by a predicate version of itself. The subject version is followed by the predicate, which is still itself, yes, but but that split between the, the functionality or the efficacy of a, of a subject and a predicate is, is it's okay. <laughs> it's just actually good. Really, huh. it, it, it's, it's, it's at least an illustration of the flow of a concept through internal contradiction and internal Imminent critique. Yes, that's why I prefer cats too, Nevin. Um, yeah, sh yeah. La language is a poor. Okay, an example. You know how how um what's his face Heidegger said uh, that language is the house of being. Um, you know he says language is the house of being. Um, I was reading Zizek his book uh, Sex and the Failed Absolute. And he said a Hegelian reading of this would be language is the is the torture house of being it's where being comes to be to be sliced apart and forced into a, into shackles and beaten and to, to, taught to be obedient you know uh or or the madhouse of being where where it just totally loses itself you know um and and we could get into that but that would take me bring up notes um, hey, let me can i ask you a question yeah quick? so here's something that makes sense to me and tell me if this is is part of what you're saying in this subject predicate thing. When I, if I, I, I mean, it only, it makes most sense when I try to talk about myself rather than try to talk about something else. So if I say, I am I, or I am Nevit, then what's happening is I, the subject, am trying to, I'm speaking of my sub, I'm speaking of myself as though I were an object. So when I say, I am I, what I've done is I've doubled the I because I, the subject, am I the object. And so that, I, that the, the subject, the, the I that is the subject is, has absolutely no way of 
intuiting, I mean, this is, you know, Hume's point, Kant's point, probably Hegel's point. The, the eye has Deleuze's no point too. What's that? It's Deleuze's point and too. Deleuze's point too, that the eye has no way of directly encountering the eye. And so whenever I say I am I, I have doubled the eye and created something that is not I that I can understand. So the I that I talk about is not the I that I am. Is that is that similar to what you're talking about? Yeah. No, yeah. Language? yeah. Yeah, yes, 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 yes. Direct, like de definitely, I think, in the in the sense that like the the I as the encountering thing, as this thing that encounters, can't encounter itself. And, th and this is where neo-Hegelians get off on saying this, that they say like the I as the encountering thing can't encounter itself within objective reality and thus is a moving, living sort of pillar of, or not even like a pillar, but like a pinhole in the fabric of objective reality, in the fabric of experienceable, direct, objective reality, subject, constitutively, is this walking, living, breathing example of objectivity's failure because subject cannot fully objectivize itself, cannot ever find itself within the objective order, can never find equality between itself and the objective order. It has objectal correlates. And this is, and, and literally this is actually, now that we're in this place of thinking, Nevit, this is where Lacan says object A is. This is, that's his definition of object A. Object petit A is the objective, correlate of subject subjectivity. Subjectivity navigates the world, can never find itself, but has this necessary like, it's like a placenta in, or something, you know what I mean? It's like this, this other thing, this objectal correlate of what a subject is in the objective realm, in the realm of objective experienceable reality. He says that's object A or object petit A, interchangeable. Um, so I've got a couple things. Um, just back to this, does self-consciousness concretize or do the concrete aspects produce the self-consciousness? To go back to that part that Nevitt was reading. So, so the point about language is that the eye has its existence as existence and its true nature in language. This eye and the universal eye, you know what I mean? And, and a good example would be the, the perfectly dialectical sentence would be, I am right here with you right now. I am, I am here with you right now. That is, that is the absolute farthest extreme of particularity and individuality and specificity as I can possibly manifest with language. I am here with you right now. <laughs> and yet at the same time, it's a completely vacuous universal that anybody could say at any time and it would still be coherent or, or not even with you. I am here right now. You know what I mean? It's, it's the epitome of particularity and also this just totally empty, this totally universal thing. So it's this coincidence of universality and thisness this I and the universal I, uh, and the, the relinquishing and disappearance and appearance of, okay. So the point, the reason that he says that, what does that mean is happening? He says, the eyes disappearing is also, it's lasting. He says those two terms. He says, it's disappearing is it's lasting, which, you know, we can, we can make sense of. It's disappearing is it's lasting. And then he says a really complicated sentence where he says, in a self knowing itself and passing to an other self, which is hearing and is universal. And that I just kind of wrote down as like a formality. I was like, look, I'm not gonna move my brain around like that through all those selves you just brought up. I'm not, I'm not actually gonna follow that, but I, I can I see the picture you're painting. I get it, you know what I mean? Or I have a, I, I have a sense of, you know, but uh, so so there's this space of the eye in language being talked about by a self knowing itself and passing this eye or itself over to an other self which is hearing and is universal and in this space these this this spirit containing or 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 uh, interacting with uh, this actuality which is hearing it 
Uh, it contains this actuality here because the extremes whose unity it is, just as immediately each have the determination to be for itself its own actuality, their unity is subverted into aloof aspects, each of which is for the other an actual object excluded from it. So what I, what, yeah, it's, yeah, it does. It is kind of like he's talking about time and the mode of the passing present. Like, yeah, yeah, it's, it's in this, yeah. I, I agree with the connection you're making, Chase. I, I agree. But, but what I think he's getting at, or well, a way to think of what he's getting at when he's saying that beginning part and, the, and even like the rest of the part that's on page 295 through 508, through section 508, is that these aspects, actuality and consciousness, or, or, or let's say state power and wealth, or good and bad, they are self-sufficient. They, they each have the determination to be for itself its own actuality. Each one has for itself its own determination to be for itself its own actuality, which means that it has the, it has the, the get up and go to sit there and, and stand you know, as its own independent self-sufficient term. It has the, the necessary gear as a, as a term to stand self-sufficiently. It can do it, right? And we register that it can do that, right? And that the space that it is in is of things that do that. And thus, the, the, their unity, their unity, if we can posit term one, term two, and then the difference between them, term one, term two, and then the space between them, term one, term two, and their unity, whatever we wanna call that, if we have two terms at all. And Hegel would say that one is always two, which is always actually three. <laughs> it's one is the difference between it. One is actually two because one is actually the a thing and then uh, it's internal negation. It's void um, and, and or, or, or it's internal contradiction that, that causes its dissolution. Its own, it, it, the term is the void, the thing in its void and then from between them comes up the, the, the difference between the two of them. So one cannot be by itself because a rose is a rose. A rose is a rose. And now we have two roses, oh shit. And then what's the difference between the two roses? Oh, it's this third thing right here. So one is always three, which is very weird, I know. But this third thing, comes on the scene as an existent mediating middle as par for the course of the other two aspects in their uh, exclusivity as actual objects. The unity emerges as a mediating middle. He puts it in, in, in italics as like this, this it's, like a new, it's like he's saying, it's appearing as another solid term. It appears as like this solid entity between them, this mediating middle which is excluded and distinguished from the departed actuality of the two aspects. Thus, it itself has an actual objectivity that is differentiated from its aspects. It's for them. It is existent. And we, we know what he means when he's, after at this point, when he's saying like, for them, existent, this, this relational thing, this simple self, this simple soul or, or whatever, you know? <coughs> It's not the whole character of the thing, but it is the thing as it represents itself to other things. And because it is entering the frame of being in the space of two other things, it is relational. And or it is at least, at the very least, related to them. And therefore, it is to be related to them. This is the problem that Chase was running into in trying to combine two different things. They can't be two totally, radically, absolutely different things for them to combine at all, you know what I mean? And Chase, you could correct me if I'm wrong here, but it's like, they have to have a relation. They have to have a relation to come, to, to come together or to be a unity or to even interact. And that relation is thus a non-difference. It's a relation. It's like, oh, I relate to you on that one, you know? And, and for, for them to be related in a space of actually existent objects, there has to be an actually existent objective relation. And that actually objective existent relation is spirituality. 
And that's where he's saying spirit comes into existence as spirituality, which is, I think the difference is like spirit concretizes and then it itself is concretized as spirituality, which, which I can point to the exact sentence if we need to, but I don't think I need to No, it's, it's right there. It's he, uh, he also used the word spiritual substance. And that's what I was, I was, what I was wondering, and maybe this is what you're saying, like in the first sentence of 508, it sounds like he's describing what you described back a few pages ago, where spirit sort of pushes apart these opposites. And, and then when spirit does that, then he uses the word later on, the spiritual substance enters into existence. And then as you pointed out, then a few lines down later, he says spirit comes into existence as spirituality. So I'm wondering if he, if, you know, if, is, is, am I just looking at, a, am I just making this difference up? Or is he saying that you have spirit who does, whatever spirit is that kind of separates these opposites. And when spirit does that, spiritual substance emerges as spirituality, as kind of a, a third thing. I agree. I agree. I think so. I think it's spirit in its intervention into existence and its representation of itself to us as an existent part of existence. It, it is red. We see it not as pure, actual, total, whole spirit, but as spirituality. You know what I mean? Like... That's, and I, so I think you, I agree with you. I agree with your reading. Yeah, okay, so one way that this makes sense to me is by looking at it in terms of language where you would have some kind of uh, polar terms, extreme terms in some way, but that these are in some sense external to what they're relating um, through language. Um, but also to a certain extent, there's a, the relation itself has a kind of actuality to it. Um, so in my, for itself, in my intention to, to mean something, to express something, by putting that into language, in some sense, I'm externalizing that and giving that a kind of life of its own that in some sense, preserves what I'm trying to express, but also differentiates it into a different form. And that creates this kind of objective thing where I, I say something like this sentence right here. And from there, someone can take that and try to process that as a sense, as uh, having some kind of meaning that relates back to a for itself so you get this kind of uh reversal of flipping of the in itself and the for itself um these two different terms or i think what he what he talks about as a intention and purpose and things like that um by thinking of of it in that terms, I can see how spirit would be something where it is the this relation that is kind of reciprocally generated both from it's putting together these opposite opposite terms, these different terms, uh, which is could be, and also I see Hunter's point that it has this kind of indefinite multiplicity kind of added to it, where you know this is to some degree also kind of what happens just with my own uh, I myself in thinking, it already is this kind of splitting aspect in that in order to just simply think of myself uh, already there, it's being put into the form of language in, in my inner monologue. That's already once again, differentiating it, but also relating it in some sense to what it's kind of uh, repeating, what it's modeled after in some sense, what it's disguising itself as by speaking, uh, by even thinking in the terms of I. Um, and then that itself in my speaking it, once again, also relates and differentiates it into language where you get these kind of, um, you know, transformative modes into uh, consciousness, into different forms. I'm thinking mainly of 
uh, for itself and in itself, um, where it still contains something, but yet also changes it. And the way that those can relate yet be differentiated, I think that's kind of what Hale is, is talking about in terms of sublation, uh, but also just the way that spirit was just described earlier too. So I think by thinking of it in terms of a relation that simultaneously kind of unifies, but also distinguishes uh, things, but then in itself um, becomes its own kind of actuality. Uh, it's, so it's this kind of complex form that's emergent from relations, but also, yeah, basically what I just said. Um, but I think language is a way to, you know, this is obviously this is so abstract, but it, it's a way of thinking about it that somewhat gives it a concrete form, somewhat, at least. Um, at least, does, does anyone else, uh, does that help anyone else? Because it, it, it kind of helps me uh, get the sense of what Hegel himself is putting into language. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, to me, I'm, uh, and it could be my Wittgensteinian traditions, I read a lot of language as a social construct component of that in this, and that in 508, where, you know, Hunter read earlier, where he says that it exists for others, like, so you have separate individuality comes into such existence so that it exists for others. I think he's emphasizing that it's not language alone that is able to express self, but the process with other beings perceiving you, which is kind of a very Wittgensteinian tradition, I suppose. But I like that language is a social construct existing for others and itself not being a perception of self, but in its process, that's what helps to find a self or can give you a visage of self in the process of communicating. Uh, have you guys talked about 521 at all yet? Okay, well, I, I this part stood out. Are to we me. are we on five twenty one? I didn't read five twenty one. I stopped at five ten. Crap. Wait, I, I thought that was last. I thought five ten was last week. Oh, we're, wait, did remember, you... we're a, a week behind. Or, yeah, a week behind. Oh. <laughs> did you double read one time? He did. I, you I were did. way ahead yeah, of the class, thought, man. God. That's I thought, awesome. I thought. Well, all right. Well. Nobody can give you crap about being a sound major. You read more Hegel than any of us. Yeah, I thought, I don't know what it was. I thought, I, I thought I was behind one week, but I guess that was the week that we talked about the introduction or whatever. And so the, this whole time I thought I was behind and I, I like last week I, I, I read ahead. And then this week I, I yeah, read next week. So, well, I'm, I'm just not going to say anything then. Hmm. Oh, please do. You know, you read him further. Um, okay. Yeah. yeah. If it's related to what we're talking about, please don't, don't not share it. I mean, okay, fine. I'll share it. Uh, but yeah, I was reading, I actually really liked, uh, there's a section uh, and, and there's just kind of a few things that I'll, I'll kind of pull from. I, I don't really fully understand it, but uh, at the very beginning of 521, uh, they talk, he says, the content of spirit's speech about itself and its speech concerning itself thus inverts all concepts and realities. It is thus the universal deception of itself and others. And for that very reason, the greatest truth is the shamelessness in stating this deceit. Uh, <laughs> uh, which I, I just, I think it, it relates kind of to what you guys are talking about and this idea of like this kind of deceitful nature of language and, and kind of trying to talk about it so that we can kind of uh, move past it and there's this really cool thing this, this really cool part where he basically I'll, I'll just read it because it's cool where he says this speech right after he says that he says this speech is the madness of the musician who piled up and mixed together some 30 airs Italian French tragic comic of all sorts of characters now with a deep bass he descended into the depths of hell then contracting his throat with a falsetto he tore apart the vaults of the skies alternately raging and then being placated imperious and then derisive and it's a quotation apparently so i don't know if he's just kind of if he came up with that and is describing it as this sort of specific speech um but he kind of goes on and on about like this idea of like 
what the good and the bad is. And, and one of the things I really liked later on, he kind of talks about it in the next couple of paragraphs is that, you know, to, to try and talk about the good and the bad, the only way to sort of do it is in the sort of disorientation, uh, to kind of describe both, to, to put both in their context and then kind of move back and forth between them. And he describes this other sort of, he calls it the simple consciousness, trying to describe the good as, as something separate from the bad without, without descri describing the good without the bad. Um, and, and how definitively that, that sort of leads to this sort of withdrawal from, from the world and from, from experience. And so I, one of my favorite books is, uh, uh, the brothers Karamazov, uh, and, you know, I just started thinking about um, Father Zosima telling uh, uh, Alyosha, this sort of young up and coming priest uh, who, who basically wants to live in sort of not exile, but live, you know, at, in, in, the, in the church, you know, and become a monk and kind of separate himself from all these crazy things happening in his life and in his family. And Zosima tells him, no, you need to go out there you need to live with them you need to experience that you need to be there for them and sort of be this good thing you can't you can't sort of be good in any sense without being around the bad without without mingling with these people who who need you who who need this goodness inside of you you know and 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 i just think about that i don't even know really if that's what he's trying to say but i i guess i just feel like you know to try and be good and then withdraw from that which is bad is to to sort of in the same way i think i, I kind of talked about you know when we were reading uh oedipus to kind of ignore the things that are bad gives them more power you know if, if there's no struggle against these bad things then we will just kind of let them sort of you know take control of us, you know, and, and we'll, we'll withdraw them and not sort of really experience them. And so to, to really be good, to do good is sort of to be disoriented uh, totally by, by that which is good and bad and, and to still within that fight for, for the good, uh, you know. And so I, I and, and I think that that's kind of what I see as this defect of language is this just essential disorientation you know, like what you guys are talking about. It's like a defect, but it's also, you know, there's no real way to sort of definitively connect these two ideas. You know, we're, we're disoriented just by trying to speak, you know, and, and, and I think for me, I kind of imagine language as sort of this, this abstraction from like something that we can't speak about, you know, that, that we have these feelings that slowly sort of abstract into, into these concepts. And once they turn into concepts, they're, they're sort of distanced from these feelings. You know, they're, they're not expressed in the way that we, they sort of appeared within us. You know, we're, we're trying to explain them. So they sort of distance from this original feeling or idea or whatever, um, you know. And, and so it's like, I, th I think that there is this essential sort of deception in language where you are trying to, to say something but the whole time, you know that you're you're sort of failing to say what you really mean. <laughs> uh, and and yeah. all right, whatever. Uh, <laughs> you just quoted Wittgenstein in it, in that which we should be, we cannot speak, we should remain silent. I'm sorry, I'm a huge Wiggy fan. I was like, oh, he said it. That's amazing. Well, you yeah, haven't that's... read the Tractatus, have you read it? No, I've not. You no. just quoted it. You need to read it. It's amazing. <laughs> Chase tells me I, I quote people and I don't know it. So, but yeah, that's. I'm that's sorry, I, I won't be. I'll tone it down. No, 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 it's down. fine. <laughs> I, I appreciate your excitement. Uh, but yeah, so I don't know. I was just thinking about all that stuff. I, I'm, I'm sorry that I, I went ahead. I was seriously like, how have we not talked about this part? This part's crazy. I, I, I'm, and then now it all makes sense. So I'm sorry about that. That's, uh, that, I don't know, it sounds very, that's very, uh, relevant i think i i'm not I, i'm not exactly sure i mean my my suspicion is it's it's probably strongly related to that thing that hunter was talking about it you know that the 
the subject predicate automatically d doubles things. I'm going to have to I have to hassle my cats here in a minute. Um, but the, but I, but you know the thing about language, it's kind of what it reminds me of is, you know, this this uh, disease we have where we're trying to think about what we're experiencing while we're experiencing it, or even even worse, you know, which I'm guilty of. You know, today, uh, you know, taking pictures of the experience while you're having the experience, you know, the language seems to be a, a more intimate version of that, you know, where you're, you're trying to express what you're experiencing while you're experiencing, but the expression of it in language distances you from the experience. It, it reduces it to, to conceptuality, which at least seems to be, uh, you know, similar to this, like you said, this sort of inherent problem with language. Right. But, okay, so what about the when the language itself is the expression that becomes the phenomena or whatnot? Um, that's what I was thinking is, okay, you can say I'm trying to capture some kind of uh, indeterminate feeling and I have to use some kind of um, esoteric German word or something from Finnegan's Wake, um, uh, a chaosmos to describe uh, the way that order and chaos come together. Um, so, or I'm thinking you can do this outside of concepts as well by just, you know, the kind of raw affect of your voice of expression. Uh, so I can just kind of, uh, you know, try to communicate with, what was that, the the donkey or whatever that Hunter mentioned? Um, you know, I try to communicate with this donkey and just, it just kind of makes some kind of donkey-esque kind of noise. That itself can become the new phenomena that how do I capture then the sense of that? Um, so, you know, I think, if I have a point here, which is up for grabs, I don't know, but maybe one way of thinking of that is that there's there's a sense involved with these things and the sense um, is always gonna be this thing that is elusive. And in order to really try to get it, it it's, it's never gonna be something that it can be reduced to its actuality of there's no word that I can say that can just simply express its own sense in a way uh, without actually becoming nonsense. Um, that's probably too esoteric for here, but the sense of the way I use a word, it's, its whole context and everything that gets thrown into it to give it a sense is always going to be something different for, for other people, yet it is also something that kind of comes together that we can form uh, this intersubjective relation with. And that's what actually gives it its sense, its meaning, is this thing that is um, something more than just my it, original intention to express what I mean. And I think the way that language can kind of go uh, outside itself like that is somewhat what uh, Hegel is talking about here. And also this whole thing with the this process whereby relations happen, I think he's also getting at that. Um, you know, one thing is it, this, it sounds a lot like what he's talking about is, is time and relations of time, but he never actually really talks about that. Um, so I'm kind of confused by that to a certain degree. Um, okay. Eric, I see you're mentioning Lewis Carroll. Um, so I was reading uh, The Logic of Sense, uh, Deleuze, and it's kind of about Lewis Carroll where he talks about this kind of stuff, but it seems to be related in a uh, at least in a way that I can kind of make sense of uh, with Hegel. So that's strange bedfellows, but that's always the way it works, right? I don't know. I, 
I have a question about the section 507, then again on page 295 in the Cambridge edition. Um, and the relationship between the I and language. So Hunter mentioned this before. And, and you know, so we've been talking about how language always fails to capture, I guess, what it's supposed to indicate or, or, or uh, point at. But here at the top in 295, he says, however language contains the I in its purity, it alone expresses the I itself. This, its existence is as existence and objectivity which has its true nature in language. The I is this I, but is just as much universal. Its appearance is just as much the self relinquishing and the disappearance of this I, and as a result, its, remain, it, its remaining in its universality. The I that expresses itself is brought to a hearing. It is an infection, which that is very interesting. I don't really know what he means by that, but that that's interesting, an infection. But I guess what I, and then, you know, later, uh, Hunter read this stuff about, you know, this weird Hegel speak about it is there, it is not there, and through this disappearance, it is there. You know, what the hell? And so I, what I, here's my speculation, and I'm not, sh I'm not sure, but it's like when, you know, through the, and then, you know, as jo Joseph pointed out, there's something about the communal nature of language that's going on here, too, that I'm, I'm not quite catching here, but that it's like through the, ex through light linguistic expression, I say, I, I am here. <laughs> but when I say the word I, the fact that I can say it, that I can speak it, tells me I'm referring to a universal, because language only traffics in universals, in concepts. Language cannot express a bare particular, whether it's a bare particular thing or whether it's a bare particular I. And so when I say I exist, I mean, I'm, one, I'm wondering if this is what that, it is there, it is not there, if, if this is what he's talking about, because I, I really don't, I'm not sure. You know, it's like I say, I am here. <laughs> But the I that I am speaking about cannot be the bare particular I because, again, language cannot express the bare particular. And so in some sense, the, when I say I am here, the bare particular I evaporates into the universal because that's what I just spoke. But then it kind of rebounds into my experience of existence. And it just sits there and kind of bounces back and forth between my ability to say I, which is speaking universal, and then my rudimentary, again, I don't, I don't claim I have any, any uh, direct uh, fundamental experience of the I itself, but, but that I have some bare experience of, of existing or thinking. That, so is that what he's talking about? It is, it is there, it is not there, it is there, it is not there, it is this kind of ricocheting between the universal that I can think and speak and the experience of being here now. That's, that was a question. Yeah, I, so. Chase, you muted. Okay, sorry, I'm muted. Um, which is probably good because I ended up just cussing at myself, but um, I'm, posting this okay so hopefully i'm not just kind of repeating myself here but i think that is kind of what he's saying also in the sense of okay the infection of what's going on is that there's these communal modes of language as i put right there um something like the king uh that you know the quilting point becomes the king uh you know we've got all these connections of language that, you know, eventually adheres, coheres onto this notion of the king that becomes a kind of force in itself over a language where that power of something within culture um, becomes somewhat adherent to the way that it's actually expressed in language and conceptually as the king um the monarch and that itself has a way of 
forcing itself into our own thinking because we have to think through a language that we didn't ourselves create. We maybe have some kind of an intimate relation with our thinking, but at the same time, that intimate relation is always in the voice of some other uh, because language is this other. It's um, And then I think that's kind of what he's talking about as an infection. Um, but also in the way that you've got this, once again, these kind of um, interrelational mixing points um, with uh, this notion of how universals and particulars work. Um, so in that sense, yeah, I, I speak through, I speak of the king, I speak of all these concepts that make sense to people, hopefully, um, because I'm speaking not in this solipsistic language. I, this is not a private language that I created myself. Um, and by that fact, I have a capacity to go outside myself to express myself. But in that very act, I'm also doing something that separates that any kind of an intimate self uh, from myself. And I think that is what he's getting at with this split notion um but also the way that this universal kind of cultural expressions of kings and whatnot uh, already infects that very intimacy that we have as ourself and that um all these transformations and the way that they as a process sort of relate to each other but yet differentiate each other i think that's what he's getting at that that's spirit and spirit is this thing that transforms the sense of things and transforms uh, in order to actually make this connection possible, um, something like that. Um, at least that's how I kind of make sense of it myself. Um, yeah. I don't know. I, I and again, not to get too Wittgensteinian, but I immediately think of the beetle in the box analogy when it comes to his thought experiment for expressing language, which is very similar to what I think Hegel's talking about when expressing the pure eye. And that if everybody got together and nobody's seen a beetle, nobody's ever been around a beetle, nobody knows what a beetle is, but they had to use. A language to describe what's in their box as a beetle to others that's going to essentially be the construct of language that doesn't necessarily reflect what's in the box or what's in a beetle because only that person can look in the box and see their beetle but it's just a mere reflection of it so it becomes almost infectious in that it's a social construct or a game that lets the eye or what limited subjective experience you have is the eye pass into others. Now, I don't know if he's saying that you really can show it through language, but it almost seems like he's saying in that vanishing moment, it's more of a communal construct of the eye that can be used in a positive or negative way. Because it seems like he's saying that culture uses language to avoid what uh, death itself and that's what I took away from it. Culture as in the bad culture, like this self-perpetuating culture that wants to destroy the natural self and just self-perpetuate itself as the ultimate consciousness when it really isn't. But doesn't don't, does don't all cultures or all human communities try to replicate themselves? So when whatever series of odd events or happenstance, but just say, hey, this worked for us in the past, let's maybe make it into a rule and tie some ritual to it. And hey, we fermented something accidentally and that should, you know, maybe help social cohesion and now, but we've got rules. And I mean, it, I mean, what culture doesn't try to replicate itself? Well, I think he's saying that the, the, universal spirits of culture is to essentially create itself to conform itself to like you will be a cultured individual if you prove yourself as a cultured individual to me you don't have participation in the ethical community 
that I think he's championing, you're only cultured when I deem you necessary of being a cultured person. Like how much Hegel have you read? How much <laughs> classical music do you understand? And it, it, it's that self-perpetuation of the cultured individual that uses language as a means to avoid anything that destroys itself almost replicating universal self. No. So, okay, so I think this is a part where I didn't get to that in the reading, uh, but- The, the noble so, consciousness, I think is what he called it in section 510 and 511. So he's saying that culture is a way to kind of um, keep a, well, I'm gonna say a particular culture, but I think he's saying the opposite. Um, so in the, I did manage to read some of the, the logic of desire, the secondary source. And he was saying that, um, that it, it uses something like, I forget the, how he translated something different. I don't think culture, something about the nobility, but this idea of, okay, the, a cultured approach to things is a way of this self-preservation of a universal aspect of culture that kind of extends itself uh, above, past uh, the particular individuals of that compose a culture. Is it something like that? And that that's also what is this mode of infection that, which that sounds a lot like what, how he talks about life uh, in general in the very first section where he talks about that in terms of the species and uh, the individual, that there's this species uh, of a kind of universal that always overextends and has to, it necessarily has to um, negate the individual, uh, but yet works through the individual. I mean, it's to put it in plain terms, it's basically think about it, people have to die uh, in order for people for life to go on, for the human species to work, it's pretty necessary. Uh, that's why we have reproduction. That's why we have birth and this whole stream of multiplicity of life. Uh, it seems to work best that way when you have the individual that can actually die, but yet something else has to pass on in between that. Um, and what is that? That's kind of this culture, right? And the, the medium of it is something, these images, language, things like that. Is, is, he, is that something like what he's getting at um, by saying that? But then, so part of the problem I think I would have by this, at least that I, I highlighted it in my, my secondary source um, was that he's equating European culture with universal which seems to me a contradiction and not even a, a good one in the Hegelian sense, but just a, a Eurocentric uh, kind of contradiction in the sense that uh, there's other cultures than Europe, I think, uh, last time I checked. So is he saying that or is, he, is it more something like, a little more subtle than that in that he's saying um, that European civilization and culture does a kind of universal thing, but through its, while kind of preserving its particularity and its and whatnot, um, or is, is there room for other cultures? I guess this also relates to what we were talking about at the very beginning about contingency and necessity and whatnot, you know, is the, the development of the absolute monarch, is that necessary, contingent? And would since, you know, the same thing with Western culture, is this, you know, the beacon of cultural progress? Um, can, it, can it contain or, or with a, a whole nother culture that's different, um, also arising in a similar but different way or I'm not sure exactly what's going on there, but um, 
is that something like what he's talking about with culture and how does that relate to the the universal and particular kind of thing yeah i think we read i'm sorry did we read section 494 today because i think that goes with what you're saying where he says it is also the work and the simple result from which the sense that it results from their doing has vanished it remains the absolute foundation it's <clears throat> substance of all they do like the participation in that culture the work is all they do which is very different from the ethical community he was describing previously so it's almost like we started with the ethical community and now we're realizing that that culture is what he's describing to and this one in 494 seems to be one where instead of your existence and participation in the family and the government is it's more your work and what subsides into this self-replicating culture that's like a vis a poor visage of what the ethical community is your worth is determined by what you participate in your work and only that which i think he's talking in a not good way about here here's my um i don't know maybe this is more what, what neo nevit hegelian or neo hegelian or something in hegel i'm not sure but you know with regard to that question about the uh, necessity or the or the natural progress of dialectic what, what i wonder you know way back we were looking at that section where he talks about the crux of the matter and then it, it pops up again here. I, I'm not sure, you know, my sense then was that the crux of the matter is the unification of the particular and the universal. And that ultimately that's kind of what the dialectic does and is, is to, to, you know, to, to, to unify those two th through the, these dialectical processes. And so I, you know, so I'm kind of thinking, I'm wondering if, if what he's saying then is that the reason you get these increasingly complex social structures is because they are part of this process of trying to unify the individual with the universal or, or showing that unity or something like that. And I, you know, and, and so then I don't know, you know, like, Hunter was saying, I haven't read further, so I don't know what he's going to say about the monarchy. But in, in one way, you know, you can see the monarch is the sort of ultimate expression of that because the monarch becomes the universal. But I, I wonder, and I don't, again, this is where I, you know, maybe Hegel wouldn't. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you do not want to be a net at anything. Um, so, you know, what I'm thinking is, is maybe he would say that if you look at the, you know, the human species in general, maybe if he knew what we know of now about diverse cultures and if he wasn't such so Eurocentric, that there's something essentially social about humanity, period. And you see, you know, because he talks initially about the family, you know, as this sort of initial family unit. And so there's this dialectical process that emerges from the individual and then into the family. And then, you know, even in, in, in uh, I don't know what to call them, I mean, primitive is not the right word, but you know, in simpler cultures, you have tribal organizations that are greater than the family. And so there seems to be this natural process of forming these complex social organizations. And I'm wondering if Hegel would say that the, you, this is where you see the dialectic fundamentally trying to, I don't know what to say, instantiate or form or something the unification of the particular and the universal. And, you know, maybe in tribal cultures, you see this as a chieftain or something like that. But maybe the Eurocentrism comes about and that he thinks that, well, then now you really see this ultimately in the European culture. You know, this is where you see the culmination of this process or something. And, you know, maybe he's just being a Eurocentric dick, but, may, but maybe he, you know, it, maybe he's still right, maybe in the sense that, there's still this dialectic at work where you see, that, see this process and he was just Eurocentric in, in claiming that the European manifestation is the sort of ultimate because you see these large multicultural cosmopolitan cities in which the universal becomes more comprehensive, something like that. So there's a guess. Um, I'll say that, I mean, I, I'm not going to pretend that and like I'm not going to do I, I hate those people who will go back to somebody from like 1505 and will reread everything they wrote and be like 
actually, it turns out, they were more progressive than anybody alive today. You just were an idiot. And it turns out this, this Spanish inquisitor during the Middle Ages was actually this herald of like new age progressive values that people on Twitter would totally agree with. You know what I mean? I don't think that Hegel would, would be very popular. <laughs> I think that he was, he was kind of racist um, and definitely kind of Eurocentrist in his discussions of uh, other cultures and his discussions of African cultures and his discussion of Native Americans or First Nations peoples. He's a little short-sighted, kind of presumptuous. But, at, but here's the one thing. I'll say he's Eurocentrist, but with a twist, uh, with, an, with an unfortunate twist. And it's that, I, oh, not really. I mean, I think, I think that he's Eurocentrist in the sense when he, not in his like, like Nevit, I think your reading of his notion of monarchy is is pretty much like spot on. Like I think like his like like the monarch is just a functional sort of element of a of a series of spirits or self consciousnesses interacting, you know, yeah. as it, as they just exist. I think that so like yeah, the chieftain or something is is is, is in a similar position or something. But I, I I and then you said it could be that he's, you know, Eurocentrist, yes, in the sense that he's saying like, we have like an, like, yeah, maybe those other tribal people, simpler cultures or whatever he might call them would say that they have a chieftain or whatever, but a European monarch, that is like the de facto example of this. Maybe, and honestly, maybe he is kind of saying that, but I don't know, but, but I do think he's Eurocentrist, but in a different way, in a whole different area. I think he's Eurocentrist when it comes to things like the enlightenment, I think that he is Eurocentrist in terms of, but the, the twist is that I think it's a, it's a permissible Eurocentrism. That's the, that's the punchline. I'm gonna cut to the chase. It's a permissible form of Eurocentrism. And, I'll, and I know that that sounds contradictory, but <clears throat> he participates and well, and this is just to kind of retread over some ground that we talked about earlier. A big rule of his that I think goes on a lot is that his split from Kant, or he had plenty of splits from Kant, and he really liked Kant, and he didn't like Kant in other ways. One place where he kind of disagreed with Kant or wanted to split from Kant was he said Kant deals with normative ethics, and we participate inside of normative ethics. But Hegel is, would say that those normative ethics, those normative faculties of culture, this, like this whole section, you know, the, the genesis of, of culture, the formation of culture, is working both in and on those norms, not just in, not just in, but in and on. Like, yeah, also, yeah, Chase, you're right. The, I, I will say, I think he's pretty, he's pretty chill about Haiti. He's a big fan of Haiti. He's, he's, it's really easy to talk about Hegel and Haiti. He seems, and if you just end there when you're talk, trying to introduce somebody to Hegel, he seems like really cool, <laughs> but whatever. Um, my thing is, I think he's Eurocentrist in the sense that he's operating in and on a, I'm gonna use a really weird word that I hear Matt Squires say a lot, but he says the mythopoetic landscape. I like would never say that, but he says it a lot. And I would say that, and it's great. It works really well here. I think that Hegel works in and on this Western European mythopoetic landscape. And what that means is not just, yeah, when I think of mythos, it's not just that he's like, I'm European, so I'm gonna write for Europeans and I'm gonna write about European stuff because that just makes sense. It's not that. It's that he is born into a society and a surrounding set of societies that are in the wake of events like the death of Christ uh, and the rise of democracy as a concept, you know what I mean? And the, the advent of, of the multiplicity of forms and institutions that embody Christianity, you know what I mean? And there are particular features of those events, of those moves, I guess, that I think he would say are 
not only good illustrations, like what you were saying, Nevitt, like it's a good illustration of this idea. A good way to think of like a monarch is like the Queen of England, for example. Um, but there are a set of, or not a set of, but there are, there's a series of ideas in the storehouse of history amidst the history of the Western world that can be raided by our hands as contemporary people and, and investigated for, for salient content in terms, of, in terms of orienting our philosophical project in determining our objectives and our, and our desires and figuring out how we operate. And, and one example of this would be, what he might say would be that there is something particular, there is something semi-particular, at, at least in a minimal way, semi-particular to this Western canon, to the Western canon, something at least somewhat particular to it. And it is the, it is the imminent interlocking of particularity and universality. And it's in, and, and the best way to look at this is Kierkegaard, in my opinion. One of the best, one of the most clear writers on this idea was Kierkegaard, in my opinion, it was his writing that the only way that you can ever have access to universality, the only way that you can ever really come into contact with the absolute or the divine is totally inside yourself, totally individual, totally alone, totally secret, totally, 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 totally individual, only as a particular, limited, othered, individual person can you claim access to the universality of a relationship towards the divine or to the absolute or to the universal and and this is where i think zizek this just to just to, this is an example zizek gets off being a, a cartesian zizek is like a hardcore cartesian yeah the universal singular zizek is a hardcore cartesian in the sense that he says that like capital puts us into a position where we are reduced down to something, if we are going to theorize about it, that is functionally or you know, effectively akin to or homologous to Descartes' cogito, the Cartesian cogito. You'd say that capital reduces the subject to something like the Cartesian cogito. And it's like this sort of, this sort of, intertwining of of alienation and and unification in the same move i think that it's not that he would say necessarily that it's impossible for eastern canons to think of it or you know people from asian or east asian philosophies could could never have thought of such a thing or whatever maybe he did think that i don't know him i may he might have actually thought that i don't know though but because i i don't talk to him but what I, what I know that I think he's saying is that at least that, that these universal elements of the logic of a moving term within this landscape operate in such a way as to be somewhat parallel to the way that they've operated. At, 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 and I'm trying to be super, super conservative with my words here, which is making it more confusing. I know, I'm sorry, but like my a, bit, a different way to word that is just that like, there are things worth saving in the European project. They are not necessarily, it's nothing about being European that makes them special or like only European people could think of them or whatever. European people aren't particularly special, but the European project has yielded important important lessons about who we are and how we operate and and what we can strive for in terms of freedom and contact with the absolute and truth you know what i mean and how it's not impossible it's it's really imminently it's it's possible it's right there and and we can look back at this history at this european history and see it kind of clearly embodied you know um and it can be learned from but yeah so i like a lot of your points hunter um 
Although I wonder, so I don't know uh, uh, what Hegel wrote about, say, tribal or indigenous cultures or whatnot, um, but I wonder how this could be put into a Hegelian frame um, that there are, if there is going to be some kind of a universal singular culture, it would be something like those kind of uh, tribal structures, I think. That would be something important to understand in the way that and also I'm kind of curious about what the fact that there's a lot of cultures that will kind of reach uh, a point where they're in relative, they're, they're metastable. Uh, if you know, they're in relative stability uh, in accord with their milieu. Um, so they don't change hardly at all for a pretty long amount of time. And how would that work in Hegelian terms? I wonder, um, would he consider that just totally that this doesn't matter because it's not, you know, dialectically uh, progressing or moving in, in any discernible way? Or would he, I'm sure he'd have something to say about that, but I'm just kind of, I don't know. I'm just kind of thinking out loud, I guess. And Travis, can things. you give us a sneak peek, Travis? Oh, he's gone. Oh, dang it. No, he's not. There you are. Okay. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> That's the answer. I, I, what I said was all I, I got. That's all I... Chase, do you have a real world example about the, this cultural... This culture that has seems to have uh, achieved stasis and stability without death? Um, I've heard that Aboriginal culture uh, is very, very old and was relatively unchanged in a lot of their practices. Their main kind of practices of, of hunting and religion and whatnot, that it was, so metastable would mean that it is a, a process, but it's something that is a, a process in relation to something that is stable. Um, or haven't there, been, um, um, haven't there been tribal cultures like in the Amazon that, like you said, existed for, I don't know, a lot, many generations, perhaps hundreds of years without intervention, you know, without an intervention from white, you know, because no one had discovered them. And, you know, when you say metastable, I think they're in kind of an organic relationship with their, um, their biological environment. And, I mean, you know, here I'm thinking almost in, in Darwinian terms, where if there isn't any pressure for the system to change and it reaches a sort of metastable state, then it can kind of hang there. So I don't know. I mean, you know, Nietzsche said that without, without uh, Hegel, there could have been no Darwin. Um, primarily what he meant was, I think, that, that it was the dialectic that brought, that raised into consciousness the possibility that species can actually change and evolve. Um, and so I don't know if, I don't know what Hegel would say, but it seems like you could, you know, you could invoke some sort of Darwinian Hegelian dialectic or something where if something reaches a, a stable, like you said, a Mabel's metastable state with this environment, there may, may be no pressure for it to move beyond that. But I, I don't, again, I don't know what Hegel would say. It's, it seems like it would be difficult to say if, because he wants to say that its own internal kind of movement is what continues the dialectic. Uh, you know, so there is a, there is a culture, uh, you know, it's an Amazonian tribe or something that um, has remained relatively stable according to our standards, you know, for a certain amount of time. But uh, how does that relate to the dialectic as it would progress in, you know, uh, 18th century France or something. It seems just, uh, well, it's very different, but yet related in the same way that even just thinking about it, even, and I would probably have to think about it in at least somewhat uh, Darwinian evolutionary terms myself and to connect both of those myself, but it's kind of, yeah. 
it's difficult to get exactly what I think Hegel would say. But. Well, it, it would be, I mean, I'm, I'm not going to pretend I'm speaking for Hegel. I'm just with what I've read in anthropology. And, and if you just look at world history, no, no offense to the Amazonian peoples. And, and we have to think of them as more than one people, right? I mean, they're, they have different languages that they, they, they might have similarities in terms of their material cultures, given, given the constraints of their environment, but also think of the Kalahari Bushmen, uh, which has, it seems to have a very egalitarian society, uh, not really a concept that much of private property. Um, but c compare those, let, let's pretend that they are steady state, which I think we have to be careful um, because that has its own implications of, you know, Rousseauian primitive savage, or you yeah. know, it's it's a it's a non-European Eden, and you know, this noble savage and all that. So I I I, I think you know, and and you are being careful, Chase. I'm not suggesting you weren't, but you weren't. But uh, but if you look at the totality of human existence right today what percentage of these people are living in a steady state culture that doesn't seem to have really powerful movements in them th that are causing changes, really identifiable changes. I mean, is it one half of 1%? And that's, that's not saying it's not important, but, but what I'm saying is if, he, if someone's trying to get to very broad patterns of history does one half of one percent being an outlier to his argument negate his argument I, my guess is it's more than that but i i don't really know but i you know here's another possible hegelian explanation but i think this one is also eurocentric or western centric or whatever is that rather than saying it, you know it reaches the state of um of, uh, I forgot what the term Chase used, equilibrium. Metastable. Metastable. Um, you know what, maybe Hegel would say that there are, that there are I don't know what, social or environmental forces that prevent the dialectic from advancing. You know, so that rather than saying it reaches a, a metastable state that's in equilibrium in its environment, maybe Hegel would say that if the dialectic had, you know, had free play, it would continue to go, but there's these external factors that are kind of keeping a lid on it and holding it, preventing it. But I think that's probably also a, you know, a Western prejudice to say that, you know, because, you know, as I've heard people say, you know, well, obviously, you know, Western culture is better off than, you know, so, well, it depends on what you mean by better off. Yeah. So, yeah. So I think well, one I thing is following up on what Neville just said, what if there were dialectics in the Kalahari Bushman society that we don't know about and that this, they have achieved a synthesis and it's just a synthesis that looks very much different from anything in the broader, you know, late capitalist post-industrial world. Yeah, yeah. That, I think that's what I was about to get into and in saying that there, you have to look at it from a different uh, value system kind of almost completely uh, in the sense that you know we have this sort of built-in idea that you know progress is good and you know to a certain degree I, I agree with that um, and change is good and all these things so then from that perspective another culture that doesn't just even superficially show those things will appear as uh, you know bad in some way by those same standards but I think if you look at it, okay, well, the same culture of European culture that we're talking about is giving us uh, something that's just like a kind of like a freight train, just out of control consumption kind of thing going on. Um, so it's definitely it's progressing, it's changing. You know, no one's denying that. Um, but then again, it's kind of changing and progressing in this way where it's kind of like a giant self-destructive machine eating itself and it's just eating more and more of itself. Um, where if you look at a kind of uh, 
tribal culture that's metastable, um, it's in this kind of dynamic balance with its environment in a way that that is not um, destroying everything in this uh, stupid way that I think uh, European culture and uh, late capitalism is. Um, so I think there's, and I don't think it's about necessarily saying that, you know, one thing is good and moral and another one isn't or something like that. And I definitely think, I mean, I'm basically a Nietzschean, so I don't think in moral terms usually. Um, but uh, yeah, that's kind of my thinking of it is that there's these multiplicities that have just different kind of dynamics with their environment. And I, I think that's why it seems to me that you can't say that there's just one kind of internal logic that develops these things. Um, and I, I'm not even really sure that Hegel is even really saying that. <laughs> so, you know, Hegel's confusing anyways, but um, I, I just wonder if that kind of, just that basic kind of multiplicity of, of cultures, but yet they're also a kind of, so I, I think the idea of a universal singularity is appropriate in the sense that, so singular, does, this doesn't mean that there's just, you know, it's all one thing, but it's singular, it's unique. And by thinking in, in that terms, I think we can get a better sense of just uh, cultural anthropology as a, as a global force where you have all these different uh, forces kind of interpenetrating and whatnot, but yet we have these different cultures that sh can show different ways of living and being. Um, and I think if anything, um, European Western culture that we're just by, you know, consuming our minds with Hegel, we're full of, uh, we can learn maybe other models uh, to go along with that. But so when Hunter just popped up, that just reminded me though, uh, but at the same time, I agree with what Hunter is saying that there's an importance to uh, simply understanding the Western canon and whatnot. Um, if anything, so we can critique it. But at the same time, I, I admit, I, I love Western literature and Western philosophy and everything. It's, it's great. I, I mean, we're uh, Sophocles, you know, I mean, it's, it's, that is Oedipus Rex. That's, basically Western literature, it'll always right there. It, Bible, maybe it gets complex with that, but Sophocles is awesome. I love that. Um, indoor, indoor plumbing is good. I agree. Re refrigerated air is very good. Air conditioning is amazing. I love indoor air plumbing. It's gonna be big. <laughs> indoor plumbing is great. Yeah, but it, to to go with what Chase was saying, I mean, to to and before I know we're going a little tired. I'm sorry, but in five oh six, he he is uh, what I found most striking was he said that state power, therefore, still lacks a will with which to oppose counsel and the power to decide which of the different opinion is best for the general good. It is not yet a government, and therefore, not yet in truth an actual state power. The being for self, the will, which is as will is not sacrificed is the inner separated from spirit as the various classes and estates he quotes. And this, in spite of its chatter, and I like that he used the word chatter about the general good, reserves to make itself what suits its own best interest and is inclined to make this chatter about the general good a substitute for action. And I think that's where the chatter and the language comes in, is that the state which is a state power or more of an empirical power, which base its participation on ownership and production needs to replace. Uh, and he goes on further to say that the sacrifice of existence, which happens in the service of the state is indeed complete when it has gone so far as death, but the hazard of death with which the individual survives leaves him with a definitive existence and hence with a particular self-interest so when somebody dies for the state it's particular self-interest so how do you replace death for the state since that's the ultimate form of universality the only way you can do that is with pointless language or chatter that would explain politics yeah it, it goes into what yeah like sorry 
I'm done talking. I've talked too much. Yeah. Hmm. People are bailing. Yeah. Chase, you I need to. Food? I need to eat my salad and then uh, do some other stuff. So. Yeah, you get your your mom makes you food. I got to go cook my own pork chop. Yeah. Yeah, Chase. When is your mom going to cook us all food? We can get. Yeah. To eat apart. <laughs> I'll, I'll have to ask. Yeah. Okay. I'll bring Thank that you. up. <laughs> Sounds good. Bye. See you later. Bye. Bye.